speak or sorry so if you can do it be great um yeah so um we have hold on let me get out of full view um so yeah we have ne next month's speaker is going to be dave landon from the university of massachusetts and he will be talking about um the palisades and some of the other excavations that have taken place down in plymouth um proper for the old sort of plymouth colony puritan so timely for thanksgiving um we have a episode for episode six for digging in tomorrow um which will be at 1 30 you can sign up on our webinar registration and it's going to be dr laura he stout also of umass boston um not that i personally stack umass boston into everything uh, and she'll be talking about disability and ableism in archaeology. And there's nothing really going on for the Peabody Institute right now. So um, I will introduce our speaker. Uh, we are joined by uh, John Campbell, and he is a PhD candidate at Memorial University of Newfoundland and a project archaeology at the Public Archaeology Lab Incorporated in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Mr. Campbell's graduate research examines millennia of ancestral Mi'kmaq lifeways within uh, Mi'kmaq or the Mi'kmaq homeland with his doctoral research emphasizing Mi'kmaq perspectivism during the genesis of the North American fur trade. As an anthropological archeologist, Mr. Campbell applies a direct historical approach um, to focus on cultural memory, language and social practice surrounding material culture to further accentuate past indigenous lifeways. So thank you for joining us today, John. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate being here. Uh, and thanks for the kind introduction. Um, really appreciate it. Uh, this presentation today is gonna be a little informal. I'm uh, running low on sleep. And this is my master's research that I'm kind of uh, re-exploring as we go along as well. Um, and there's a Red Sox game. We know everyone there's a Red Sox game. And yeah, there's a Red Sox game coming up. We can't interrupt that. That's a no-no here. Um, so before I begin um, going any further, I just wanted to say uh, thanks to the people at the bottom. So it's the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative uh, from left to right. Uh, Memorial University of Newfoundland, Public Archaeology Laboratory, uh, KD University in uh, Newfoundland, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, the Nova Scotia Museum, and the Atlantic Canadian uh, Funding uh, Grant um, for the 2015 and 18 excavations. So anyway, uh, this paper is exploring the meanderings of the Annapolis River, the Boswell site and insights to the transition archaic period from 4100 to 2700 BP. Uh, that's kind of loose. Um, we're looking more at Cal BP if you want to get technical, but that's here or there. So uh, part of this is a bunch of my master's research, like I said earlier, but also there's a forthcoming article uh, by my supervisor, Dr. Michael Deal, myself, and a colleague, uh, Bryn Tapper, more nuance and, and stuff as well. So I'm not going to give everything away. No, so, uh, So exactly what is the Boswell? The background there with the uh, canopies and the tarps and everything going on. And upon finding uh, what is in the bottom left-hand corner is a broad point base and a uh, preformer knife. Uh, they brought it to the Nova Scotia Museum and the Nova Scotia Museum in turn uh, talked with my supervisor, Dr. Uh, Deal, about uh, doing excavations uh, along the Annapolis River uh, to, to further investigate exactly what is going on there. And specifically with, uh, if you look at the background too, I just want to note, if you do see the Annapolis River at any other time during this presentation, it's much lower. That's pretty much as high as it gets without flooding normally. So just for, you know, uh, comparative. So spatially speaking, the Boswell site, like I said, is on the Annapolis River, but it's actually within um, this bigger kind of landform known as the Annapolis Valley. The Annapolis Valley is kind of this elongated valley with the Annapolis uh, River running from the midsection to the southwest and the Cornwallis to the midsection northeast. 
The North Mountain is to the west, and the South Mountain is obviously to the south. Uh, the Annapolis River goes out to Annapolis Basin, Digby Gut. Uh, people most likely would know that area for Port Royal. And then up north, it ends up kind of around the Wolfville Starks Point area with uh, some other archaeological uh, points of interest like Gaspar Lake, as you can see, to the east of Boswell. And of course, Scotts Bay, Cap Door, and Il Hot. Uh, towards uh, the from the Minas Basin out into the Bay of Fundy, which would then further the Gulf of Maine. So, uh, one thing I wanted to do here before we continue further was kind of bring in some of the philosophy, uh, Mi'kmaq philosophy behind this research as well, and incorporating other research uh, aspects as, uh, going on within the region. So, maybe we'll learn some Mi'kmaq. Let's see. So the first word is eduabmok, eduabmok. The K is a G, the T is a D, the P is a B, eduabmok. So that means two-eyed seeing, and that's learning to see from one eye with the strengths of indigenous knowledge as ways of knowing, and from the other, the strengths of the Western knowledges and the ways of knowing. And if you use both, you benefit all. And so, uh, this comes from, I believe, I'm trying to remember if it was Elder, I think it was Elder Marshall. Uh, this is recorded by Bartlett. And it's been, re, it's been used in a lot of collaborative research recently uh, in Canada as well as uh, just North America in general, the US, about how two-eyed seeing benefits collaborative research. Although really, Ed Lab Monk comes from the Mi'kmaq perspective, not really any other uh, perspectives. Um, this one's gonna be a little bit of a tongue twister. So, Dan Wedges Scaliette. So it's Dan Wedges Scaliatic. So Dan Wedges Scaliatic is this philosophy of the interrelationship between the Mi'kmaq, their landscape, and how that affects their psyche. And this is also through the mediums of cultural memory and language. Uh, Dan Wedges Scaliatic is where I sprouted from. So where my roots lie and where I sprout from. So it's very much about landscape and who they are and how that does affect uh, their cultural identity. Right, so Nigmat, uh, Nigmat, if I'm doing the D, D-U-D. Uh, it focuses on the people and their relationships uh, to their ancestors, one another, and future generations. So the, uh, theoretically, if you go down the ontological turn, if you didn't wanna go that way, it's really the interrelationship between Things, beings, animism, inanimism, uh, people, uh, and it surpasses spatiality and time, right? Generations and ancestors and elders. So these are three pieces of philosophy that kind of came into the research that we were doing. So just as a cursory, we'll go back to this later. We created a larger map. So if I may for a second, I'll just bring us back to the beginning. Yeah, one site. Kind of boring. We're including these names, toponyms, and doing toponymic analysis. And essentially, what we're trying to look at is why are people, why would they be at the Boswell site? What are they doing around there? And place names speak about uh, social practice uh, because it's a verbal based language. It tells you what's kind of going on. So let's take, for example, one of the close ones to Boswell. It's Nikta. Nikta's Nikta Falls. That's where the eels are. Okay, so that kind of, that tells you what's going on up the way, down the way. And if we go north a bit, you can see Kopitek. Kopitek is Aylesford Bog. Kopitek is the home of the beaver. Beavers play another important role in the relationship, you know, in ontological and animism further on. <clears throat> Down the theoretical uh, rabbit hole. But again, we'll come back to this in a second, just to show again what's going on at the Boswell site and why it's important for uh, other investigations in the region. So <clears throat> one of the key things we need to look at is the archaeological chronology and the archaeological record. 
going from the paleo to the archaic to the woodland to the contact and historic. But one thing we do uh, <clears throat> up in up in this area when we're studying with the Mi'kmaq is that we incorporate their own chronology, their own perspective upon the past and how that's actually interpreted through their culture of Mi'kmaq research at the Nova Scotia Museum. <clears throat> and also uh, captain of the Grand Council, uh, Roger Lewis, was the one who actually kind of formulated this chronology. And it was based off of stories from the elders. Um, the stories from the elders were done in the Mi'kmaq tongue, like, uh, you know, Muasami, Sequiej. And that was basically <clears throat> kind of interpreted to be these time frames, how the stories were being told. And what were they talking about? The ancients, the not so ancients. So it's really interesting to kind of bring in that chronology with the archaeological one. And it, it kind of enhances what we're looking at, bringing in different perspectives, um, and also kind of relaying maybe some of the oral traditions that we keep hearing, um, especially that have been ethnographically recorded. So when doing that, but looking at the Boswell site, we're looking at two different um, time periods in all reality, when we don't look at the archaeological, but just the Mi'kmaq. So instead of looking at the transitional archaic, early woodland, middle woodland, and late woodland, we're looking at the Muasami Geju Gwejol No. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's spelt there. That's it. Muasami Geju Gwejol No, which is the not so recent ones. And then Geskue Olno, the recent ones, the woodland period as we call it from the archeological record. And what I provided here is at least an example of a broad point found at the Boswell site, what would be kind of considered an Atlantic point at um, this juncture, uh, and also uh, pottery from the middle woodland period, but again, this wedge will know, uh, found at the Boswell site as well. But let's get into the actual excavations at the Basel site to kind of understand the history of it. So it's going to take the time. Oh, there we go. So the Basel survey map, this is from 2012, kind of showing a really weird sketch. So you probably don't really understand what's going on here, but the green is land, the blue is the water, there's bedrock in the water. That's a fish hole. So like an actual natural hole that's been made where the fish kind of settle to get out of the, the way, almost like a little eddy. And the way that the hills are running, if you can look at the contours a bit, you can see that there's this nice terrace um, running around uh, that area. And then the gravel veneer down to where the fine spot is. So in 2011 and 2012, Dr. Michael Deal went with two of his graduate students, uh, Cameron Milner and Adrian Morrison, uh, and was assisted by Heather McLeod Leslie from the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative, as well as um, Jody Howe, a uh, Mi'kmaq student, and also with the Mi'kmaq Rights Initiative. So you can see from these photos, uh, Cameron is, I wanna say, no joke, 6-1, so that's your scale. And that's what they were initially looking at, trying to find the transitional occupation along the river, especially in what was called, known as the Ripardian zone, the area right next to the river. And we can see um, in the uh, upper right-hand side, uh, Heather McLeod Leslie <clears throat> with Jody Howe in the back, background with her mom, uh, even further in the background, excavating uh, the woodland component of the site and finding ceramics in which Adrian and Cameron in the bottom right-hand corner are actually block lifting them out in order to collect them and excavate them down within a block to make sure that they get the pot, the whole, all the pots, from the, all the pieces of the pot uh, from its discard. So moving on to 2014, when I arrived late to the scene, of course, um, what our plan was, was to return to the area Uh, initially looked at by Cameron, Adrian, and obviously Dr. Michael Deal in order to try to look through um, the alluvial strats to see what occupations were actually underneath them or what was going on. And so you can kind of see the process from one, two, three to four 
Um, three being on the opposite side of where I am in four towards the river. You can kind of see it in the background. Uh, we had to step in, in, obviously, so we wouldn't, you know, uh, be crushed by the weight of the soil or anything like that. Um, but at two and a half meters, we were finding some interesting stuff and we collected a lot of samples uh, to be, uh, for later analysis, uh, a lot of ecofax, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, but an interesting factoid about this, which may surprise some people, but in Nova Scotia, they were not digging this deep uh, to look for uh, this kind of these kinds of materials, or maybe this kind of occupation. Um, so if you look up, if you look at a lot of the archaeology, a lot of it ends up being woodland. Um, but this was kind of one of the first real deep uh, and deeply stratified sites that were actually excavated and found uh, materials in situ. But uh, I mean, meanwhile, while I'm taking all these soil samples to collect the ecofax, charcoal, all that stuff, I get tired at times and I take a little dirt nap. Um, not, I'm not gonna lie, pretty relaxing, very chilling, very cold, uh, great on a hot day. And when there's mosquitoes buzzing around you, when you're low like that, they'll never come after you. So, and there's a bar for scale. So, you know, uh, <laughs> two and a half meters when you see it. Um, and this is just a collection of some of the photos of our time there during the 2015 excavations. Uh, Michael, uh, I'm gonna go from upper left to right and down. So uh, Dr. Michael Deal and my colleague, uh, Brent Tapper, overlooking some of the excavations after finding the first in-situ uh, broad point at the site. Uh, Dr. Deal down at the river after we found a bunch of the transitional archaic component in the actual river having been eroded already from uh, ATV tracks going over into the, through the river to the other side. Um, as you can see, the river, that was uh, one of its higher points during the time of excavations. That's what I meant by it being higher earlier now it being lower. Um, so Mike is looking for a bunch of stuff in the water. Uh, the next photo is myself, Bryn, and in the back there is Aaron Taylor. Uh, Aaron Taylor is in another photo to the bottom uh, left. Uh, he's currently in the Chris of Oak Island. Uh, you may have known him from that, but he actually helped at the Boswell site before he uh, did his PhD research. Um, my beautiful wife in the center, uh, center left, uh, Bryn taking a, a snooze kind of in the midsection there while me and Mike are on the right section while me and Mike are uh, chatting about uh, uh, lithics. Again, Aaron Taylor and Heather McLeod Leslie uh, recording uh, a pretty in-depth deposit there. Uh, the bottom center is actually Bryn with uh, the first ever broad point found in situ at the site. And then we have in the bottom Drew, uh, Heather McLeod Leslie's uh, daughter finding a point in the wall, <laughs> literally sitting on it. Uh, more fond memories, I guess. Um, so this is the collection uh, in all of its glory. You saw it on the poster probably. But this is kind of what was found between 2014 and 2015. And my initial kind of research question was, what is a common tool type? Or not common tool type, but what is the tool kit of the, of the culture? Is there like a common tool kit? Or are we looking at a diverse amount of toolkits during the transitional archaic period? Now, transitional archaic period, I should have said earlier, is defined in a couple of different ways. Um, but the first one of it all, pun, is it's that it's got a broad point uh, technology. Differing from the pre preceding maritime archaic more head to phase. Uh, deep fishing kind of orientation to more of what it looks like to be an anadromous, catadromous, uh, riverine and lack of stream fishing, for the most part with hunting and trapping, of course. Um, another factor is about this uh, culture, steed type bowl production, which is a big, big deal in New England. Uh, it's kind of rare in the Maritimes. There's only a handful of, of examples, only one complete bowl uh, in New Brunswick. So as far as I know, um, from that period, um, as far as we can tell from, from research, uh, it looks like uh, dugout canoe technology was predominant. We're not sure about birch bark canoe technology, although that has been a question, especially down uh, in Southern New England. 
uh, drill technology as well that goes with the steatite. Um, and what you'll notice too, this is kind of interesting. If you look at the scale bar in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see the second one in is a little rounded. So what happened was, is that it was a point that was snapped in the medial section or midsection and then reworked and, and uh, basically rounded off. Now, when you rework something, it's usually still on the haft or the handle. And in this case, it looks like a lot of the examples from Turner Farm, which is uh, Vinyl Haven, Maine. And it's in Penobscot Bay in Vinyl Haven, Maine. And what they're pretty much looked at, like they're like striker lights, they're the first kind of big lighter. Um, and what you need is either a pyrite, maybe a copper or something to strike it, to start a fire. Um, Another component to this culture is also cremation burials. And it's not just one person cremation burials, this is multi-person, almost family plot cremation burials, which is really interesting and neat. Um, where a lot of sadly past artifacts have been found um, in those contexts, especially from uh, the early portion of the 20th century. Uh, so that's, that's something that's also brought up within the cultural realm. And one other thing that I kind of made note of was that they're actually using copper at this period. And we'll get to that. Where exactly is that copper coming from? It's, well, here's a hint. It's not the Great Lakes hypothesis, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, so the owner of the land, Terry Wilkins, would go out to the river, you know, sometimes to go out and fish, look for an artifact or two. He actually would help out a lot during this process, and he was a great screener. And he got really good at IDing artifacts. Really great guy. Love Terry to death. And uh, he helped us find a, a bunch of this stuff, especially like the, the Snook Kill uh, style of uh, broad point. Um, and then there is the second one in on the top. If you look, it's kind of like a Dudley variant, shape and size and scale with the ratios. Uh, that's what it's kind of looking out to be with uh, some drills and some ground stone tools as well. So that's some more stuff that was found. That top one in the center, if you're curious about what the material is, it looks like Ross Creek Jasper, Ross Creek being like Scotts Bay. And we'll get to that in a second too. So in 2018, um, Mike, uh, Dr. Deal was joined by uh, all the way to the right there is Terry Wilkins uh, excavating in 2018 to further try to figure out what's going on at the site to try to find the youngest occupation at the site, which would be like the Orient when it comes to the transitional archaic. Um, and so he did. And it looks kind of like this with a little bit of early woodland tossed in, which is for the area from a transitional going all the way from the early broad point, the Snook Kill Atlantic, right? If we're going to make equivocations to this region, to the Susquehanna, which is kind of your central, 3,600 to 3,200 uh, BP. So from 30, 41 to 36, 36 to 32, and then from 32 to 27, roughly, you get the Orient phase. Um, and we're finding some material that looks very much like that. Uh, and especially that's related to another site, which is escaping afterwards. Uh, Sanger and why is his name escaping me? Sanger and Davis uh, recorded it near Tuscan, and it looks kind of similar to that stuff. And that's actually relatively close when you talk about the region. But we're finding well, they were finding hammerstones. Um, some kind of malls. We also are seeing some perforated, so you know those drills being used to perforate. And then what that actually is is a little uh, grinding stone, sharpening stone that someone attached to some part of them that was found in conjunction with a few points. Super neat, super neat. Um, so that's uh, I think that's my deal like favorite artifact from the site. Mine's the the, the Snook Hill Atlantic, but that's me. So when you look at the layout of the site, <clears throat> up in the left-hand corner, you'll see kind of a close-up. Uh, but we tested all the way down and around the bend. No dice, nothing. 
and it was just kind of at that spot where we were landing on this component where it was literally the Atlantic component with the Susquehanna on top of it and then the Orient almost overlapping you know in a very interesting pattern with the early woodland with the uh, Orient as well uh, as you can tell from the uh, close-up you can see at the south eastern portion it's a little gnarly a little cut chopped up there that's the edge of the actual terrace and below it is uh 54 to 52 and 45 to 43 that that section that's actually in the river and we were finding artifacts where we had to record them in, in place uh some shipping debris more artifacts than anything else uh and i mean pretty much a good number of the assemblage you saw in the first photograph uh came from there so I'll continue on. So from where we dug to what we dug, uh, you'll see that there is a lot of charcoal. It's clustered. Uh, you'll see bifaces, drills. I think the thing that we're missing in this is the woodland component with the ceramics. Nice. Would have been towards the center. See my arrow in the center? No? Yes, maybe. Okay, maybe not. Oh, you can? Okay. So the woodland, yep, okay. So the woodland component would have been somewhere within this portion here. All the ceramics we're finding would have been this portion. But the Atlantic was pretty much from this area over here, your Susquehanna towards the center. And then you can kind of see these blue points from there this way was more of the Orient to early woodland. Those blue points are actually copper nodules that we found, uh, dated to 3200 BP, in conjunction with Orient Fishtail uh, uh, feature and uh, O'Hearth feature and a bunch of uh, bifaces. So pretty neat stuff. I know it looks like a lot, it is a lot, but um, it's telling us a bunch about what's going on at the site and kind of trying to deduce that here. So there's a lot of, um, environmental analysis that was done with um, in conjunction with Acadia University in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. Uh, a bunch of this has to do with uh, stratigraphy, uh, microfossils, ecofacts, including pollen, um, all this kind of analysis that had been done uh, between McGowan Lake, Kejimokujik, uh, Pleasant River Fen, Corin Lake, and then the Boswell site was kind of tossed in with that sampling strategy we had did we had done and conducted. Uh, and that was uh, done for an honors research uh, thesis uh, through there by um, Aaron McKee. And so essentially, here what I'm trying to display is uh, the green line being the late woodland, the blue being the middle woodland, and the red being the transitional archaic. This kind of gives you an idea of uh, what kind of plant species are present or very present or moderately present or not even present at all during these time frames a bit of a um evergreens during the transitional archaic a bit of a boom um with a with a bit of um some hard hardwoods coming in especially with the oaks oaks acorns um i have my thoughts about a boric culture but i won't get into it it's not it's not here nor there but um you can kind of see that within the the middle woodland and the late woodland as well as these kind of peaks to understand exactly what is going on. I won't get too far flung into it, but you can tell how the environment would have looked at the time. But one thing you can do is look at what was burned and what was not charred or burned uh, from the site, including what we look at is like seeds or botanical remains, generally speaking, ecofacts. But in this case, we're conducting uh, Paleoethnobotany, botany of the past of indigenous people. What, what exactly is going on? What are they doing? Why are they using some things? Is it medicinal? Is it just, you know, is it just food? Uh, is there something else to it? It's kind of what we wanted to look at. So we found uh well only uh, uncharted what's present what's not present 
Um, choke cherry, for example, is at 79 uh, chard. And you lift up choke cherry, and it's like almost like a, it almost can act like a Pepto Bismol, if 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 you know where I'm, I'm going with that. Um, cranberry, we all know cranberry is tasty. 260 chard seeds of that, something's going on, right? So we're an idea of what's going on, um, but also like funnel. Funnel remains not much. And when they were there, they were crushed with the ceramics. What was identifiable was in the bottom left-hand corner. And essentially only 40 beaver portions up to three minimal beavers in number were found within and among the ceramics. But in the crushed state, the question was being raised as to why. And it was kind of an understanding of beaver fat and creating more of like a, like a fat within the ceramic. For what exactly food source? Is it medicinal? Uh, that's further research to be done. And exactly why? Uh, we'll never fully know, but we can at least put some kind of idea as to what they're doing with it. But of course, up in the right-hand corner, um, up in the right-hand corner, sorry, my computer's fritzing right now. Uh, there's some detailed, uh, I guess you could say castellations, but they're not really castellations, uh, but rim shirts and rim portions of um, some of the ceramics found at the Basel site, very intricate, uh, punk tape. Uh, Some punctate, uh, mostly dentate, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not, not, the, not the best, but I try. So bear with me. For the uh, woodland period, woodland uh, date. So moving along, if I can. Yeah, my computer is being weird. Here we go. So one of the things of analysis we did, it was mostly me on this end of the research, uh, was looking at the lithics and trying to see where are they getting these from? Certainly not all local. So how far of a reach are they making to get these? Um, we had some biases. There were some that we could tell were kind of mostly this from macroscopic analysis from site. But what we needed to do was kind of do this uh, process of uh, PXRF, portable x-ray fluorescence. In layman's terms, it's shooting lasers at rocks. You, you can't be much more fun than that. And what that tells you is the elemental analysis of what the actual composition of the lithic is. And in that case, you try to get a source of that material that you're thinking may be it to fingerprint, to ID from one, the lithic you have from the site to the source potential and where it came from. And in this case, it was a little bit of searching, searching, searching to find some of these sources. Others, not so much, again, based on biases. So I did this with a bench top, as you can see, it almost looks like a little suitcase at the top, put the lithic in, you close it. This was also run with an immense amount of samples of banded spherolitic rhyolites, as well as rhyolites from all over the world. Uh, some from Japan that have the highest aluminum count, uh, others with other uh, certain elemental ratio counts to try to understand and, and create kind of a baseline for these uh, samples to be processed. Uh, this was not done with a PX gun. I understand that most people try to do PX ref with a gun. That can get complicated based on the control and conditions of how the gun is used. And the bench shop makes for a far better, um, is for a far better analysis if you do portable x-ray fluorescence. If you can do anything else, go for it. But it's just, this is what we tested during this time. So it's going to get a little graphy in a second. Ah, so if you're looking at this graph, you're like, what is going on here? I'm with you. The red dot at the top are the uh, Mount Jefferson, Mount Jasper, Mount Jefferson, Mount Jasper, correct me if I'm wrong, Berlin, New Hampshire. Uh, 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 u
sourcing from. So I asked just to see Bansphere like Rylates. Okay, this is kind of a telltale. Like, are we dealing with anything from that far away? And as you can see, all the other dots are at the bottom. From all, so the, all the other dot colors represent certain samples and sources that we recorded. Not even close. So New Hampshire, not on the, not on the, not on the dot. So we continued. And what we do here is a ratio, a ratio of certain elements, uh, zirconium and niobium to rubidium and strontium. And what that did is that got two clusters of source and material and, and artifact and another source and artifact together. The sad part is this is part of the bias. We kind of knew that these two lithics were where they're from. But it's telling as to, okay, so it's kind of clustered. We didn't get the source from exactly uh, where these lithics were made from, but it's close. So we're kind of getting an idea of what we can be looking at with benchtop uh, PXRF. Um, again, same clusters. And again, same clusters. I'm not going to go into the depth of that. So there's these two lithics we have where the sources match up. And those are, drum roll please, uh, number one, Vinyl Haven Rhyolite from Vinyl Haven, Maine, Penobscot Bay Area. And the second being Mount Kenyo Periphery, or Mount Kenyo Rhyolite, um, also known as Mount Kenyo Traveler Rhyolite from uh, uh, Moosehead Lake in Maine. Uh, so we have these two sources from basically the Penobscot River to its bay over in Nova Scotia. Very interesting stuff. But everything was kind of ID'd macroscopically or from PXRF. So the PXRF determined both one and two, but four had been seen, this dark volcanic has been recorded by David Black in the Passamaquoddy Bay region. Interestingly enough, and number three is the Scott Mountain Formation. That was off on, I got lucky with that. It's in a quarry where there's a bunch of other banded spherical cryolites, and that red stuff is the volcanic tuff that runs through a, like almost like a crest line around it. And it's, it's got to be that stuff. Um, again, testing to be done to confirm, but that's, I'm pretty, I'm pretty much sold on that personally. Um, then we have Cobequid uh, Highlands Ryolite coming up from uh, Cobequid. The Ross, uh, the Ross Creek Jasper that I was talking about earlier is actually number six, that image right there in the Susquehanna style point. Uh, that has, uh, essentially that is uh, uh, petrified wood. It's so neat. So it's petrified wood and it has like little geodes in it. Uh, that if you get into the aesthetics and our artistic way of, you know, um, napping, certainly that point was uh, aesthetically made. And then seven is white rock quartzite. May not look like much, but it's a big quartz uh, quartzite outcrop. It's kind of like how in New England you have Cheshire quartzite. Similar stuff. Similar kind of, not material, but importance and like usage in the region. Um, and then what's in yellow is the most interesting of all, native copper sources. I was mentioning that, Great Lakes. The native copper in the region is pretty dense. And from reports, it looks like it could have been easily collected and cold hammered. Um, this going in, in this time period of the transition archaic, uh, copper being found in Massachusetts, uh, Maine, uh, now in Nova Scotia. I'm trying to remember if New Brunswick may have a, a sample. I'm not totally sure. I'd have to confirm with them, but that's off the top of my head. So some interesting stuff. Um, also, just to note before I forget, the uh, Mount Kineo Rhyolite, the piece that you're seeing here on the screen, uh, that's what we found at Boswell, and it kind of looks like some of the stuff that Borstel recorded uh, and, and Sanger from the Young Hirondo site uh, in Maine as well. So if you want to look into that, pretty interesting stuff. And some of the dates we have kind of match with that. 
So what is going on with the chronology? What is going on with all this diagnostic stuff? What are we doing with it? So we got radiocarbon dating pretty much adjacent to or within uh, where these artifacts are found, within with the ceramics. When it comes to artifacts, it is literally the radiocarbon date or the charcoal pretty much touching it. Um, and that's how we try to keep it, as you can say. So the red being the red outline boxes correlate with that red highlighted in the uh, oxcal calibrations. Yellow, again, within the yellow, the blue within the blue, uh, the yellow being mostly the copper. So this early transitional archaic component from 4100 to, to, to 3600, what other sites in the region are coming up with these dates and what are we looking at? So we kind of kept it to Maine the Maritimes just to keep it easy because if we did, started doing Southern New England, it would have blown up. Um, so essentially it looks like this. Uh, you have uh, the Orange Bee site complex, Sebastian Cook Fishware, Sharrow site, which is a really good, um, really good site to look at. Young Hirondo, like I talked about, Turner Farm. Uh, Resort de Caps, if I'm pronouncing that wrong, I apologize, my French is atrocious. Um, but number six uh, is kind of this weird outlier. If you look up north towards the uh, Gaspé Peninsula, just north of Maine, you'll see uh, that's where it is, cremation burial recorded with kind of this like broad point technology. Interesting outlier, but via riverine systems, not outside the realm of possibility. And then of course we have the Boswell site laying in the Annapolis Valley region. So more to do with this site. So we even did more of this dating to see between 44,000 to 38, and we kept going with it. What else is popping up? So with this, it was Eddington then popped up to fall into this time range. And we also had Cal Point falling within this time range. It's pretty interesting. So during this time range, with some of the stuff that's going on at Boswell, we're like trying to see what's going on where and with whom. And this isn't a complete picture by all means. It just means it's just more research and more um, integration of data in order to get a, a much better map of what people are doing and where they're living at this time, right? So for the late transitional, we're looking again, orient phase for the Southern New Englanders, we're talking uh, Wayland Notch, Mansion Inn, uh, kind of stuff as well. Um, Coburn Dudley, um, Wayland, kind of stuff, but mostly orient fish too. So we found this blade up in the left-hand corner was right next to that copper nodule sitting right next, right within the, the, the hearth, the fire hearth uh, feature. Um, so to kind of look at what's going on at this time period, again, some main sites and then Boswell, we're looking at Mugford, Cheryl again. Uh, Cheryl's gonna be in here a bunch because it's a highly stratified site. Yale Hirondo again matches uh, Turner Farm and then yeah, Boswell. So not too much going on during this time period, like the Orient phase. So this is kind of getting towards the tail end of my presentation today. Uh, so bear with me just for a little bit longer. So the, why Boswell? Why would you ever stop there? Aside from the anatomous fish and the catatomous fish, it's a static river section. Hmm. So, my colleague Brendan and myself looked over it with a map, just basic Google map. And what we did was we did a preliminary, where's the static portions of the Annapolis River? Those are in red, the Annapolis River being the blue. Okay, how many archeology span sites are within these static areas? And are they only in these static areas? The answer is no, they're not only in these static areas, but we found it very interesting that there's these clusters within these static areas kind of showing why the return? Why this area? What are they doing here? So we're looking at these meanderings like, okay, so static to meandering. Okay, is there 
there anything else we can do? And as time passed, we came up with a conclusion of looking at lean per se, but it became accessible recently. So one of the portions we're going to be adding to uh, the paper at the CRGA is what you're going to be seeing next. So surprise. Um, so this may not make much sense to you, but hold on. We'll look at the top going to the bottom. So as you can see on the top, you're looking at the Boswell site. And it's in a little square with the And essentially, with the LIDAR, you can a movement and dreams of the past. I mean, um, I guess this would be paleohydrology. I don't necessarily know um, if that's the right term. But digressing, uh, essentially, what you're looking at when you see these little hanging out in these eddies responding that'd be a whole video game thing sorry lack of sleep but it, it's interesting to see where these fish pools are in, in in conjunction with like let's say two and apparently we lost our speaker um so no idea what just happened there uh, oh, there he is. Hold on, John. Let me make you co-host again. Okay, you should be able to. Um, and yes, th this is a Zoom thing. I've been having issues with Zoom all day. Um, they've been doing some sort of updating. Gotta love that. Um, so. Yeah, this is interesting. I'm so sorry for everybody watching at home, but I'm gonna keep trudging. I don't know where I left off. So um, fish pool, fish, fish pools. Fish pools, yeah. Those are the best. Um, so anyway, yeah, we got these fish pools hanging around uh, Wishwell Brook in these areas, uh, essentially where people would kind of like orient their subsistence strategies uh, along these river systems. So we're seeing that within the LIDAR. So that's around the Boswell site. We took it a bit of a step further. And we looked along the Annapolis completely. So we went uh, down to Paradise, that's a place, and Lawrencetown, Eowyn Brook, to see what's going on there. And we're looking at, generally speaking, static areas where these sites are. OK, so that's two for two. How about three for three? Yeah. OK. What's going on? Is this now uh, an intuitive sampling strategy for the region? Definitely. Could this be applied elsewhere with the LIDAR and the hydrology? Absolutely. And what patterns could be unveiled through that? Um, let's see. I mean, I think that this could be definitely applied uh, with the right methodology and the right riverine and lacus green systems. It would be pretty mind boggling. Now, with all that being said, if we go back and look at the map again, things start to kind of pick up. Canard, it's on the northern edge of um, the Annapolis Valley. Canard, the Horton, the Horton area, Hullabu is, uh, or Kalabu is caribou, right? Again, Copatec, your beaver. You go down Nikta, you're getting your eels. And at Nikta Falls, I just recently learned this, is a giant hematite source, as well as at Torbrook, which is near Wolfville. Interesting to also lay in that layer to the cultural, um, the cultural landscape. But we're starting to see that there's these spots that are constantly being used over time, over millennia, and along these static areas in which the social practice of what is going on there or why someone would go there is within the toponym itself, the place name. Very simple. When you, when you apply the language, the cultural memory, and you add the landscape, it's kind of a deadly trio. 
it gives you a lot of information without really a lot of technical work. But the technical work can be added on afterwards and really, really is using one eye as well as the other. So on that note, I'm going to leave you there. My internet's unstable again. Uh, so this is who I'd like to thank, as well as all of you beautiful folks that came out tonight to watch me before the Red Sox game, um, as well as uh, my gracious host, the MAS and the Gene Winter chapter. Uh, yeah, so let's end it. Anybody got questions? I don't know if there's a question period. I just put it in there. So if anybody's got questions, uh, I might be able to answer them. There's a question. I see a finger. Oh, what do I need to do? Wait, what? Oh, so do I need to stop sharing? I'm not sure. I don't know what's going on. Uh, chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can enable you as a host. I don't know exactly how. Oh, no. Oh, no. Um, do, 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 do. Give me, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Let's see. I am this, I am Zoom. Uh, um, oh, ha ha. That's to unmute. Okay. Sorry, everyone. Uh, Zoom booted me as host, so I couldn't unmute myself. Um, so my apologies. And sorry, John, for making you do that. No Again, sorry. this has been a 24 hours of Zoom being very epic. Um, and everything. So if you have questions, you can put it in the chat and I'll moderate it. Um, but to get a few going, um, so John, so with, you said you are going to be presenting this, uh, like a paper, uh, is it Kneha or? Um, so this paper is gonna be published in the Canadian Journal of Archaeology. Okay. Um, so then my question is, is, is this site, are you, are people continuing to sort of excavate the site or around it? Um, Cause you mm -hmm. have up until 2018, but God knows COVID has messed right. up everything, so. So there's been a bit of um, a stall on excavation since 2018. Okay. Uh, just varying parties of interest. Um, but I can say that the site is going to be uh, re-excavated and re-investigated. Uh, by my uh, friend, uh, Roger Lewis, uh, curator of the Mi'kmaq research at mm -hmm. the Nova Scotia Museum. He wants to go back and actually do archeological investigations. He holds a master's in archeology span as well. Uh, so he wants to kind of continue the research with that. Um, and that should hopefully be next summer. It sounds like it's gonna be that. Oh, cool. We'll um, see. Uh, another question that uh, there is is, um, making sure I can get this correctly. So you were saying how a lot of sites don't dig as deep, you know, archaeologists, other excavations have not dug as deep as you. Um, have you, so has this proven to archaeologists in the area that focus on the area that maybe they need to either going forward, continue to dig deeper um, to reach actually sterile soil or to go back to sites that they thought they had already reached sterile soil? Do you know what's happening there with that? Um, in some cases, and this is, again, anybody in the audience can correct me, um, but there was one woodland site that I know of, I'm not gonna name it, uh, that they did return and deeper and there were material. Okay, very interesting. Um, it seems to be a lot with the alluvial it's definitely, there's definitely more to this. So okay. it's just kind of a dig deeper kind of situation. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. We have a, a question from Sheila. Do these traditions exhibit throughout the Gulf of Maine? So is this like common what you were seeing or was this an outlier? Very good question. Um, there is a common theme. There's variations to the theme, like anything else. There's like idiosyncratic little bits that are different, but there is a common theme. Um, with the transitional archaic, usually with a Susquehanna culture, they usually term uh, in that sense. Um, one thing they look at during this period, I didn't mention it, uh, was the potential 
migration or population migration into the region of the previous uh, population. Not so much. Um, the potential of coalescence still exists. The potential of there not being a migration, we're not totally sure as of yet. But the material culture comes in out of the blue all of a sudden without any kind of uh, mixing of the previous tool sets. So it just kind of cuts in, shows up, and it's very much similar across the board. So what we're finding in Nova Scotia, we could say, oh, that's an Atlantic point in Massachusetts. But because I'm not in Massachusetts and we haven't come up with a typology per se in Nova Scotia, I don't want to conflate one to the other. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's a lot of similarities, but we're not totally sure about the bigger picture yet. <laughs> if, that's, if that's enough to say, I don't know. <laughs> oh, again? Yeah, okay. So Lindsay's been booted again. Um, I don't know what's going on, but here's Lindsay. Okay, I literally want to throw Zoom out the window right now. So yeah. we do have a question from Naomi, um, and I will just give you, I don't know if you know Naomi Ritterford, she has done pollen analysis, so that's where this question is sort of coming from. Great. So, uh, it's sort of uh, a two part, but we'll start with the pollen one first. Was the pollen collected close to your study site? On the pollen diagram, there is an interesting increase in alder pollen following the most recent period you investigated, suggesting a hydrological change towards much wetter conditions. Do you know mm -hmm. what may have caused this? Caused the wetter conditions? I don't know, or caused the change, yeah. The, the increase in causing environmental change. Yeah. I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Um, um sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, her other one was: Is it possible that archaeological evidence has been lost at mobile sections of the river due to riverine erosion? Absolutely. Okay. It's not that they weren't staying there and that there weren't sites. It's just the continuum. I really should have prefaced it that way. It's really the continuum of time is at the static zones. Oh, there could have been a bazillion sites along the, the meandering portions, but it changes. So there's probably a whole bunch of artifacts and stuff laying at the bottom of the river and down downstream and collected by who knows who from those areas. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot of evidence. There's a lot of information lost too. <laughs> yeah, no, of course. Um, yeah. And I think for our last question uh, for the evening, um, is we have a question from Bill that he grew up near the Susquehanna and so thinks of that term locally, but you use the term much more expansively. What is encompassed by the term? Great question. Um, let me be blunt. I hate the term. Okay. Oh. Not a fan. Uh, the reason for the broad points especially the Susquehanna style, Perkyomans, uh, these kind of lithic types and the culture has been used within the Susquehanna, like the Susquehanna term has been used in conjunction with this. It's kind of like finding a point in one spot and saying, oh, Brewerton, because we found it there, but everywhere else it's Brewerton too, but no, it's never really was a Brewerton. Same thing with Susquehanna. Uh, the term is because of where it was found. Doesn't mean it was the most populous, it doesn't mean that it was the first spot. Actually, it was more sort of towards Georgia we're finding the broad point to be kind of mm -hmm. starting during the Savannah River complex. So why is it not the Savannah River complex that's going up the, the East Coast? It's one of those things. So it's a name that's stuck. And as much as I'd love to try to remove it to, to try to get more of a research question out of it as to what are these people doing, not necessarily the Susquehanna people near Susquehanna, I'd love to. But technology is a thing that sticks and it sometimes sticks a little too much. I, I would agree with that. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, I will let slip in one more question and, sure, we'll, sure. and we'll be done. Um, so Jamie uh, says, I would like to do archeological work in Canada. As an American citizen, where should I look for either employment, volunteer or educational opportunities for archeologists to work in Canada? Oh boy. <laughs> It all depends on interest. Um, 
as an American that went to Canada, it's not the most difficult thing in the world. Um, as an American going to Canada, I can also say that sometimes it's cheaper to go there. Just say it's sometimes cheaper. <clears throat> but on top of everything else, it all really depends on uh, what program you're looking for. It's not really a bad spot in Canada to go to. Um, there's a plethora of, of cold resource management firms, especially more on the corporate end, engineering firms uh, that you can get employment in. Uh, if you're into more of the public outreach, public archaeology, public heritage, there's a lot of heritage in Canada where they do a lot of interpretation and you don't have to be wearing a costume if you don't like it. I know some people get touchy. Um, but there's so much to do up there. Uh, if you're interested, look. If you're really interested, my email's right there. Uh, if you can still see it, I'm not sure if you can. Is it still up there? Well, yes, it is. Share screen? Yep. So yeah. So if, if you really want, just send me an email and uh, I'll palinc.com and I'll, and I'll, and tell me what you're interested in. Uh, I can talk to you all day. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not going to keep people from the Red Sox game. I'm not going to do that. Um. Yeah. With that, thank you, John, uh, for talking with us tonight. Thank you for everyone joining. Uh, sorry for all the technical difficulties of tonight's evening. Um, and yeah, we'll see everyone next month for Dr. David Landon um, in this timely, you know, Pilgrim's talk uh, right before Thanksgiving. You know, you got to lean into it, right? Uh, and everything. He was also my advisor on my master's thesis, which was about Pilgrim. So, you know, I'm a little... Little there you go. There. So, okay. Have a great night, everyone.